A very good evening to one and all present here. On behalf of this, I welcome you all to our sixth Vartha Lab session today, which is on role of PCK in science teaching, an illustrative representation from chemistry. Before moving on with the session, let me first introduce you all to our speaker for today, Professor Indira Vijay Sama. Professor Indira Vijay Sama is a teacher, teacher educator, and the founder of Purna Trust, which is a non-profit trust which manages Purna Learning Center in Bangalore, an alternative school which emerged out of her experiences from homeschooling her own children and from her reflections as an educator. She began her early career as a high school science teacher and then joined the Center for Environment Education as a teacher educator. Over the last decade, Ma'am has taught and researched at Azim Premji University. She has taught various courses and researched in the areas of teacher education, sustainability education, and science education. Professor Indra's deepest concerns are about human well-being and the role of education in promoting or harming the present and future of human well-being. Ma'am, we welcome you for our today's session. Please take over, Ma'am. Thank you. Uh, that was Niharika. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Good evening to all of you. Uh, um, and thanks for this opportunity. I hope uh, at the end of this talk, you will have uh, many um, things to think about. And uh, I hope we also have some time for discussions. I welcome. Uh, questions um, even during the presentation if there is something that you really want to ask please uh, raise your hand uh, in the chat or put a question on the chat and I hope um, Miharika or somebody will moderate and um, help yes, yes, please. The questions yeah thank you so good evening to all of you uh, I will uh, basically start with uh, some ideas broadly on science teaching and then move into uh, discussing how we can think about pedagogical content knowledge and also finally move into how we can uh, you know um, how it can work in a chemistry teaching right with using an example um, so that's how I have planned and I would like to also uh, take the stance from uh, NCRT which says um, that you know um, science teaching is basically inquiry uh, uh, based teaching is recommended for science teaching and that is considered not only uh, useful but i would say probably one of the most really effective ways of teaching science and uh, personally i think that's almost the best way to uh, get students to think about science and inquiry itself scientific inquiry can be considered as an extension of human curiosity right so uh, when we when we look at things, when we see something that draws our attention, whether we are young or old, we become curious about it and we want to find out what is going on. Uh, we want to find out more. We want to understand. Maybe we want to know why. And that's the beginning of inquiry. And scientific inquiry has taken that into uh, more, should we say, structured, more verifiable, there are many aspects to scientific inquiry and I think one of the important goals of teaching science is to uh, develop first curiosity and second uh, to move from curiosity into inquiry and into a more scientific way of inquiry and I think that's, that is what I would say is the strength of uh, an inquiry-based approach to teaching science. Um, 
uh, sadly ma many times the teaching of science uh, seems to be more or less forcing children to learn a series of facts about natural phenomena many terms many definitions um, and many uh, laws they are they have they have to learn and by heart and sometimes apply it to some textbook problems and uh, they this makes it really very uninspiring boring and even i would say counterproductive because ultimately even though they may score well in the exams they stop reasoning scientifically they don't i would say even they don't enjoy science uh, and that i think that's why i say teaching like that is very very counterproductive right um now when it comes to the aims of science education let us kind of briefly uh, look at that and we will see how this connects to the uh, basic idea about pedagogical content knowledge right so uh, science education should provide uh, students and should allow students to develop we would say three basic uh, things one of course they should learn about scientific concepts and principles and uh, become familiar with uh, the language of science uh, and i think in education uh, we have to think about how we help students negotiate the language of science and what is different uh, about uh, the language of science as compared to everyday language and i think part of the uh, thing is to help them understand how we frame certain things in more clear ways with clarity and uh, develop stronger logical uh, you know ways of express expression and this is part of learning science and also learning about scientific concepts and principles um, equally important is acquiring both the ability to reason and the procedural skills of scientists the science involves actually uh, manipulations of objects of phenomena of uh, you know material and that is equally an important part of science and finally they need to understand that science what is science and they should need to think of science not as separate from uh, our uh, normal everyday existence but as part of um, human effort you can say or part of you know so therefore uh, culture the people talk about cultures of doing science uh, science itself does it have a culture is it influenced by the culture of the scientists these are questions that are also involved when we uh, help students to think about what is science and how is it different from any other area of you know uh, thought in uh, in our society right so broadly i would say these are the three aims of science education and um, i think inquiry is a way of you know actually teaching science scientifically yeah well that's not very accurate but i would say it is for me one of the most defensible ways of teaching science um teaching through inquiry uh focuses on you know uh observation of problematizing of beginning to uh, you know uh, actively engage the learner with you know help him ask questions and also uh, find answers as it, as it were and by these i don't mean textbook questions and answers but questions that arise naturally uh, and uh, children many times we will notice that they do ask questions right and uh, there are um, you know recently i was interacting with a 3 year old who's constant question knows but why why should I, 
this and why that and uh, how and so on and so forth. It's really fascinating when you when you see the world through a small child's eyes. And there is a lovely story by Mahashweta Devi, which is also published as a children's book. Uh, some of you might have come across it. It is called The Why Why Girl. So the, this points to, uh, you know, one of the things that children seem to do naturally. But uh, coming to a, a class, you know, when you help them to inquire, then you help them to, to uh, think about what they are observing and, you know, what is the explanation, what, how they can gather the evidence and you know, a reason in, in ways that help them to develop their understanding, to question reason and think critically about phenomena. Uh, and they basically, it's child-centered, as in the, the role of the teacher in inquiry-based learning is to sort of create a conducive environment where children can explore, whether it's density or whether it is uh, the um, germination of a seed or whether it is the movement of the sun across the sky um, which students can observe uh, not directly by looking at the sun but by you know drawing the shadows on the ground there are so many things once children you draw their attention children become naturally curious on the on the way they will ask many other questions and one of the things that I think uh, is one of the most interesting things to do as an adult or as a teacher is to listen attentively to how the child is thinking and what is going on in the child's mind. Mm. And uh, so I basically what happens is that this curiosity is kind of silenced by the time the child grows up, you know, adults either become very impatient or sometimes they give very long explanations instead of actually helping the child himself or herself think about those things and uh, the child gets bored uh, often parents just you know more or less tell the child to be quiet and this uh, tendency is kind of um, suppressed um, and, and there are areas where we actively tell children don't ask about that that's not something you should think about or that's not for children and so on and so forth so there are you know ways in which we actually discourage children from being uh, curious um, so coming to children's own ideas whether you teach them or not uh, sorry if i'm going back and forth but uh, it's some words are there on the screen for you to think and read while I talk. Um, so uh, students and even us, when we look at things, we have our own ideas and conceptions about various things, right? Um, and which is necessary. We Everything that we know need not be an accurate scientific understanding. After all, even scientific understanding is not always accurate. Uh, science uh, keeps coming up with you know newer ways of understanding and uh, there is kind of a constant movement in scientific understanding itself in every field uh, however in order to function in the world we have to form our basic ideas right we form ideas rightly or wrongly we have uh, ideas and schemas, uh, mental schemas about many things and we need those. Without that we would not actually be able to function, uh, you know, and many of these things uh, we need to take for granted. So it's not always a bad thing to take things for granted, otherwise it would be very hard to actually function in this world. Um, and that's, that's something we need to keep in mind and uh, but coming to specifically uh, concepts which are related to science, if these conceptions and ideas are along the lines of what we understand after scientific inquiry, then they can serve as the basis for building deeper understanding in the courses in the course of formal science understanding, and children can you know actually uh, engage with 
many of the uh, scientific concepts and ideas that they need to. Um, um, however, despite, you know, us teaching and that has been the finding and that will be the finding for all of us, you know, who are engaged with children is that uh, students misconceptions, I'm using the word misconceptions, uh, there are politer words, but students ideas can be quite persistent. Um, and uh, this is particularly so when they are taught by conventional methods. So hence the whole new field of science education is partly an endeavor to question the way science was taught. You know, post the Newton, uh, Newtonian revolution in science, uh, textbooks were actually created to promote that kind of understanding which uh, Newton and uh, the others who built upon those ideas had of the world and they you know that's where the whole idea of popularizing the scientific ideas through textbooks and education came about however it i think uh, a few a few two three decades back the uh, when there was greater understanding about um, you know following the work of piaget and others many others have uh, taken the work much forward when we when people began to examine how ideas are uh, and ideas are linked in people's head what is a concept you know what is a concept itself can be the subject of a very many uh, pages and discussions so we can't go into that uh, today but once that kind of work began to happen and people began to uh, study cognition and cognitive understanding and how concepts are formed and developed and how people think uh, i think the realization came that you know uh, despite teaching and uh, textbook learning conceptions uh, were resistant to change Na um, so called naive conceptions persisted even in students at the postgraduate level and I think that led to a whole lot of further development in science education and um, so I think uh, we really really need to look take seriously the work of how we teach science and um, get students to change their conception it's not easy it's not easy even for us to change our conceptions and i will come back to this point a bit later uh, but um, just to point out that research suggests that the extent to which learners change their ideas depend on what they consider to be evidence for or against a competing idea and in, when it comes to the work of teaching or, you know, changing the way we teach, there are two layers of conceptions. One is the teacher's conception about the scientific phenomena itself, uh, which sometimes, um, and this, I think it is quite likely that teachers themselves may hold on uh, to some um, misconceptions about the phenomena that they are teaching but the second layer of misconception which is also there when it comes to the work of teaching is a misconceptions about how learning happens and this in my own work i have found to be very very difficult to challenge because uh, you know the way the whole science curriculum is structured the way uh, you know, science is considered to be a subject which is important for competitive exams and uh, all that uh, kind of, I would really say extraneous stuff, um, is detrimental to teachers exploring the way students actually learn about things which, are, which we want them to learn when we teach them science. So there is a, there are these two layers of conceptions or misconceptions uh, which are involved when you teach science. Namely, first, ideas about the scientific phenomena itself, and second, the ideas about how learners learn and how we can you know, help them change their conception. There is 
so many of you are uh, students of education i presume and you might have come across the conception change model you might have come across the work of people like rosalind driver susan carey uh, and so many others who are now working in this field of um, how concepts form how they change how uh, how education can you know how in the teaching we can help uh, people like Dishal has done a, they have done a lot of work on conceptual change models but it's it's uh, something that i think uh, the whole teaching profession needs to take very much more seriously uh, we will come back to this uh, soon um so i think related therefore to this idea this notion of what it means to teach science is the idea of um, pedagogical content knowledge and uh, so uh, good science teaching needs i would argue what i call or what if i i take this idea from shulman it's not my idea at all of course but i was very much struck by the uh, you know this particular idea and uh, pedagogical content knowledge for science teaching uh, we can say has these five components uh, first an orientation towards science teaching so if you if we go back to the you know the first two slides that is why i put inquiry and the aims of science teaching so these for me are important i mean we need to be clear as teachers why we are teaching children science right uh, and um, we can refer to the Kothari Commission, we can refer to our constitution, which interestingly, India is perhaps the only country which makes it a duty for its citizen to develop a scientific temper. And that's extremely, I think, um, interesting for me uh, to think about and both why should this be written into our constitution and second what does it mean to develop a scientific temper so i think this orientation towards science teaching is the first thing that is required uh, as part of the pck for a science teacher uh, the second is knowledge and beliefs about science and in particular about the science curriculum. So what is it that we should teach children? How should we teach it? At what stage we should teach what topic, etc., etc. Both knowledge. So uh, in, in, Anna, in his own writing, Shulman says that a teacher should know the curriculum both horizontally, meaning he should know all the topics that are probably taught at a particular stage uh in the school primary or middle or high uh, but it, uh, that it that is uh, also should know the curriculum vertically as in uh, how different topics are addressed in that particular subject and uh, further he says that uh, we should also understand the relation of that subject that is science to other subjects and what's being taught in mathematics what are the children learning in in language at that at the same time and uh, this is i think extremely important because otherwise it will all remain you know some kind of fragmented understanding and children don't really put it together so that is the second part knowledge and beliefs about the science curriculum in particular and how it fits with the uh, rest of the school curriculum the third which i just referred to is knowledge and belief about students understanding about specific science topics how do they understand how do they change how do they think about it how do they reason and like i said there's a lot of interesting work but it is always for me personally a great fascination to uh, spend time with children probing you know using a kind of piagetian clinical interview um, and that can be need not be done very formally you can just talk to children and you know get a sense of how they are thinking about something and it's it's extremely fascinating for me to find out and i would say more than fascinating we need to do this as teachers in order to get inside their heads and then change uh, uh, or lead we don't change it we help them change their conceptions by as Dushal pointed out in the uh, earlier slides through giving them evidence helping them reason out and so on and so forth 
it's work that never gets completed um, it doesn't get completed even personally because the more you go into a topic the more there is to learn about it and similarly the more you explore thinking uh, about a topic that goes on in the minds of children the more uh, you know you find out that it's it's a long process and it's never quite complete um, and that, that leads us to you know what are we assessing in science and how do we assess it how do, can, is it possible to find out and assess the conceptual understanding which is important um, from an educated educationist point of view and also from the aims of science right uh, how do we assess and what do we believe is important to assess um, and finally the again the point which i had referred to earlier knowledge and beliefs about instructional strategies for teaching science so what works in the science classroom um, i think one of uh, uh, my uh, students who later i could say became my colleague did an interesting piece of work to find out how effective different uh, science teachers are when it comes to and uh, not surprisingly she found well it may be surprising to some of you but uh, one of the interesting things that she found out that you know more than specific teaching strategies or uh, you know concept change what helped uh, maintain children's interest in science she did not look at children's science understanding itself not directly uh, but uh, their interest in pursuing science, she found that at least for students in class eight or so, the personal equation to the teacher was extremely important. And that held, um, that is an important factor which, you know, helps children to remain interested in science. Um, conceptual understanding was not specifically checked for. The second interesting thing that she had she found out that work is not published, but I can share it with you if you're interested. The second interesting thing that she found out was that students, that teachers across schools considered to be very bright were really not thinking very scientifically. They were the students who had just learned to crack the exams, right? They learned to uh, sort of um, get through the textbook. They, they could predict what, the teacher expected and they were you know in quote unquote good students but they were not the students who really were curious who would go and you know try something out at home who would read um, things uh, scientific magazines or you know explore things on their own so that is uh, that was very interesting again to, to realize that as teachers uh, we might be actually missing uh, the true scientists in the class and we might actually even push them out of pursuing science, at least in India, because they are, they are the ones who are given the you know lower grades. So that's something we need to think, think about very seriously. And um, I think it, it has many repercussions. The third thing, of course, she found out is that the language of science teaching, and which is English uh, in most of the private schools. We did look, her work was in, uh, I think, across five private schools, all of them following the CDSC campaign, was, um, you know, sometimes students who are actually naturally curious and inquisitive and would make, you know, have the bent of mind towards science uh, are not performing very well and are not encouraged because they have, um, they have come from homes where English is not spoken very much. So these are some of the things which I think influence and are important to see how our own knowledge and beliefs about teaching science uh, have a role and you know that forms part of the pedagogical content knowledge. And uh, for me, I think one of the uh, problems of uh, preparing teachers for science teaching is how do you shape the teacher's ideas about children's learning and uh, it, it's uh, it's i think a project which i've been personally involved in one way or the other for a very very long time uh, 
So uh, how these components fit together, there is a, a sort of a map which is taken from a book by Magnuson. I'll just leave it there for you to look at. I think it doesn't quite fit in the slide, but um, you can just spend a bit of time taking a look at it. Um, so when coming specifically, so one of the implications of this idea of PCK is that it's not a general, so what is specific and what, what is, you know, a particular, what is, what was Shulman, I mean, and Shulman's work is almost 30, more than 30 years old. But I think this notion is remains valid. You will find uh, other um, conceptions about teaching which kind of echo Shulman, but do not necessarily use the term PCK. Um, but what he says is that um, you need um, general understanding about cognitive development, um, you need general understanding about aims of teaching, but you also need specific subject specific understanding about aim of teaching a particular subject. Further, what are the misconceptions that children have in that particular topic that you're teaching and the context of the children, the language they speak, the, their, you know, their uh, social cultural milieu, if you like. And how then can you help them develop the kind of understanding that is important, the deeper conceptual understanding. And therefore, the teacher then sets up the classroom uh, um, in such a way that helps children to build their understanding, um, catering to all these kind of, um, you know, keeping from the broad aims of science education to the specific situation of that particular topic. So, uh, and PCK is, I think, almost like a craft knowledge. So you may, for example, know broadly what is it that you're creating, but you have to work with that particular material at that particular time um, and with what you have in order to, you know, get where you want to go so um and uh, an inquiry approach can serve as the hook by which teachers can capture student attention and promote conceptual change in chemistry so i i'm connecting now the concept change the bck and the inquiry approach in that one single sentence there which is uh, one to the third point in this slide an inquiry approach can serve as the hook by which teachers can capture student attention and promote conceptual change in chemistry. Uh, recall that Duchel seemed to think that uh, that is a, a better way to bring about conceptual change. So the specific ways in which a teacher sets up and coordinates inquiry-based lesson for a particular chemistry topic in a particular school, in a particular classroom, forms part of her PCK to give an example and that was that's one of the things once uh, when I was myself doing my PhD I had uh, opportunity to look at how the B ed uh, curriculum though that was not the main part of my PhD I was looking at the work of science teaching across many different schools um, but um, that during that time I found that the way uh, uh, and maybe hopefully things have changed post 2014 when there a new curriculum framework for the beard was created etc etc but uh, by and large the way students were planning lesson it is like the classroom could have been anywhere and could have consisted of any set of children it was kind of independent of what set of children you are facing and i thought that was a great shortcoming you know, how do you not bring the most important part of 
a classroom into dialogue with you know have you not planned for the specific situation of the class how can you expect a teacher to just go into any class and just deliver the lesson and that is you know uh, that so that kind of belief about teaching is actually a belief that i think is potentially problematic and that is a belief that runs through our teacher training programs and that's um, that is part of the problem um, so uh, so let's let's come to an actual example and uh, i will stop sharing screen and um, see if i can share that part of it which i have written so uh, it it's basically talking about how one of the key ideas in in chemistry uh, is is physical change and chemical change and i think that's almost the first thing first concept in chemistry that we introduce i think before that we talk about matter which is common to both physics and chemistry uh, a concept about matter and states of matter and then we move to uh, a brief i think description of substances children are taught to look about you know properties of matter so therefore you learn about transparent things um, uh, brittle things metallic things etc etc drawing attention to something which uh, physics you know so that that i think moves the thinking beyond matter so matter in physics is could be basically anything and density is one key property which determines its mass and then the whole of uh, classical physics or newtonian physics which is taught in school uh, can take from there but then you in chemistry we have to draw the child's attention to substance right so what is it that makes glass glass and wood wood and metal metal and plastic plastic and so on and so forth so and then is the next concept we talk about change uh, when does one substance change into the other and what is the difference between physical change and chemical change and one of the conditions that we uh, help children think about is reversibility so things which a change that is reversible is considered physical change and a change that is irreversible is considered or not easily reversed let me put it because uh, we do have reversible reactions and uh, chemistry is full of them but at the beginning that's how we teach and then children because of these uh, we have to simplify but at the same time when we say this children develop their own uh, you know uh, conceptions about it and uh, if they if they think about it so then they think that you know we give them examples so when water evaporates and you put a you know it can condense again give them a, uh, teach them the water cycle so the mat so it, water becomes steam and becomes water again and then you put it in the fridge and it becomes ice and so on and so forth so they they get get an idea um but then they tend to think something like mixing sugar in water is a chemical change why because uh, you can't take the once you mix the sugar into the water you can't get the sugar back at least not easily not you know uh, simply and uh, does it become something else or you know what happens to it so you this are uh, this is very very common misconception that happens um i'm just trying to see how i can stop sharing and stop video yeah stop recording now can someone help me how do i stop sharing you are sharing screen ah stop share yeah um so coming back to uh, physical change and chemical change we often sort of you know children have their own misconceptions about it and one of the things that 
you know we can do is help them think deeper about it by asking um, questions so and uh, a common common example of a chemical reaction is burning of what we like to call informal chemistry combustion right so uh, i was interacting with a group of i think uh, eight or ninth standard students and they knew all the definitions they knew the conditions of combustion they could talk about it um, but yet um, we did a very simple thing and we, we each of them had a candle and they had to light it a new candle and they had to observe quietly what was going on and uh, they had to then um, you know, share their observations. So at, at the end of that, there were many interesting, you know, discussion, dis things that they spoke about the flame, the shape of the flame, etc, etc. Then someone noticed that the candles had all gone shorter. Then someone thought of measuring, which was, I think, a very interesting um, scientific idea of measuring um, how much shorter the candles had become and then they found that you know approximately they had all shortened by the same length and then the question was posed about i want to uh, sort of uh, see whether i can get to that particular dialogue mm -hmm. so then the question was asked as to um uh, what happened you know where, why did the candle become shorter so one of the students said that the wax had evaporated uh, then the question was posed whether it was possible to collect the evaporated wax by holding a cold plate over the candle just like we can collect you know what uh, condense the steam and uh, by holding a plate over the water vapor so this boy then replied that in the case of burning the candle, the wax had changed and become something else and was not wax anymore. It becomes something else and we can't bit get it back, he said. So this showed me that even though he had used the word evaporated, he had an idea about the wax changing into a different substance. It basically, one could easily then lead him to you know, understand that what had changed was a chemical um, what had happened was a chemical reaction. Um, now thinking about it, we could have probably asked the students, I could have probably asked the students to weigh the candle, right? And see how much of the weight had uh, increased or decreased. Um, another student asked the question about, so when, when I asked them to put off the flame, they, one of the students asked the question, where does the flame go? Right? And that's a very interesting question. What, does, what happens to the flame? Um, I will uh, uh, pause here just to make sure that, you know, uh, the, I'm making some sense to my audience. So anybody would like to answer that question? Where does the flame go when we put off the candle? It extinguishes, ma'am. No supply of carbon dioxide in that case. <laughs> yeah, but what happens to the flame? You, you, you've given me another word, extinguishes. It is a conservation, a conversation of energy. Tell me more, please. Uh, like when the flame is there, the energy is in the form of heat and light. It gets converted into some other form when the flame extinguishes. So... Uh... What form does it get converted into? Yeah, that I'm also confused, but <laughs> I think. Uh, okay. okay, anybody else? Uh, the flame moves away from uh, the soap, means the substrate due to which it was burning, and that is why it gets extinguished. I mean, it, when you say extinguished, what do you mean? Let's let's try to use very, very simple words. So there was a flame, there is no flame, right? So that, so instead of saying no flame, you're saying extinguished. But my question is, what happened to it? Uh, it doesn't rise now. And because of that vapor, which is rising back, that is why, that is where the flame is there. 
So as long as vapor is there, the flame will be there. No vapor, no flame. There. Okay. So what, what? Why is there no more vapor? There is no fuel. Sorry. There was no fuel due to which it was burning. Fuel is there, right? The candle didn't disappear. Only the flame did. Oh. Uh, No heat, so any no vapor, no flame. No heat, no vapor. So why was there no heat? Uh, Ma'am, there was a reaction happening earlier when the uh, fire was being produced. That the reaction is stopped okay. because the lack of supply of the oxygen. So the reaction when it stopped, then only the flame uh, flame extinguished. Uh, but the oxygen did not stop, right? Uh, oxygen came, I guess, from the air around, and there's still air around. So I, I, the, the it was in the room. I mean, we didn't do this in a covered thing or anything. So the happened? reaction stopped. There was a process happening. Uh, the production of fire. Uh, the reaction stopped, and because of that, the fire is now no more. Okay. Um, so, so what is the fire? That would be the next question, right? Why did the stopping of the reaction result in the flame vanishing? Flame, ma'am, I, I think flame is the out uh, come of the reaction that is occurring and so as long as the reaction is occurring you can see the flame mm -hmm. and once the reactants moved apart or the reaction stopped we couldn't see the flame ah, so I we can go on um, thinking about it so why did the reaction stop is one question you could think about uh, what kept the reaction going and what is the flame any, any answers to that question? So what is the flame? When there's a reaction, there is a flame. So what is the flame really? You can say it is a product of a reaction. Yeah, but what is it? I mean, I can well, say it's it's the energy a... produced. Huh? It's the energy produced when the reaction is going on. So then light is released. Okay, it's a form so of energy. Burning of fuel. Beg your pardon? Can you repeat that? Whoever said that? Burning of fuel. Yes, burning of fuel. But the question is, what is the flame? So somebody said it is heat and light. Um, and so we changing into heat and light. So it's an exothermic reaction when the fuel means candle is being burnt uh -huh. and the flame is the form of energy that is released in that exothermic reaction. Okay, so once the reaction stops, the heat and light are no longer produced. Is that what you're saying? Yes. yes. Right, right, maybe. So I'm not sort of, uh, my uh, uh, purpose here is not to uh, kind of get at some exact answer, but to get us to think. So uh, it's a visible effect of uh, that process, com combustion process. Yes. So what is what are we seeing there? What are we seeing? Somebody already said. So what we see is the light, and uh, what we can feel the heat if we uh, put our fingers near the flame. So both heat and light are produced. Um, you know when the chemical reaction goes on and when the reaction stops there's no more heat and light and so the flame is no longer there there is no light to be seen of course it is not so simple how how come we are able to see light in that particular shape and so on and so forth if you want to really explore this idea a little further um please um you know look for uh, faraday's christmas lectures it's a series of lectures and demonstration, including 
uh, I mean about a candle burning and it, it's really brilliant so I would like you to take a look at it but let's get back to the class so this kid asks um, you know uh, where does the flame glow and then he himself continued to give an explanation for where the flame went he says uh, like the wax burns and becomes gas and mixes with the air so earlier the other student had said it evaporates when he actually meant that uh, the uh, wax burns and becomes you know uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor both of which get mixed up in the air which is fine which is what you know uh, happens and but this other student is then saying just like you know the wax burns and becomes gas and mixes with the air the flame also mixes with the air he kind of says that the flame diffuses in a way do you think he's right do you think he's right when he says that the flame mixes with the air we even though we just said that flame is heat and light anybody no, no ma'am i don't think so because to say that flame mixes with the air would be like saying that heat and light are part of it part of air mm -hmm. they're mixed in air Okay, anybody has a opposite view? Um, well, maybe in a way it is right because the heat has not vanished. What has happened to the heat that was produced? It has got transmitted and the energy has actually um, got into the molecules of air right so the heat no conservation of energy so the heat does not actually it does in, in yeah go on please so uh means it since it's not an isolated system so it's heat has mixed with the air molecules and means uh, the temperature then uh, we learn in thermodynamics right the uh, temperature is uh, uh, what is the word equilibrium is achieved from low heat system and high heat system i don't know the correct words but something around that yes yes so in a way we can say that the heat has dissipated uh, which is you know a child can use a word like mixed up it's mixed into the air it's not you know it's not a complete wrong idea but once you uh, i started probing more further conversation with this boy indicated that he thought of flame as a specific substance right like a actual substance material in another class he had offered the explanation to the question what happens when hydrogen burns and he this boy had said it will become hydrogen plus flame you know auntie like hydrogen plus oxygen gives water no like that what is it called hydrogen plus flame he, he wanted me to give a name for that compound you know hydrogen plus flame now you may think this child has quite a you know a misconception uh, interestingly when you read the history of uh, science i mean when we read about the work which was done by Lavoisier, some of you might be have heard his name. Lavoisier had a list of various elements and he did very many careful experiments measuring things and so on. And Lavoisier also thought that flame was an element. He, I think, lists it as one of the elements. So I was quite uh, struck by that, you know, when I found out that that was it was not just this child's idea that that idea had been around and that's another interesting thing that happens when you probe children's understanding you find that very often their understanding is to be found in older understandings before you know some new thinking and logical reasoning has uh, changed these ideas among the scientists 
so we we need to listen to children both carefully and with with respect and that's that's i think part of the work of uh, science teaching and um i would kind of like to stop at this point i i think we are yeah we are past uh, the five o'clock mark and maybe we have some time for questions uh, thank you for uh, you know participating in and you know responding to some of the very almost might sound silly questions that i asked as part of Thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful session. I will request my colleague, Ms. Faiza, to lead the Q&A session. Oh, thank you, Niharika. So now let us start with Q&A session. So anybody from the participants would like to ask any question or comment on something? You all can ask, ma'am, or you all can put your suggestion or comment in the chat box as well. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Maya? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Indra, ma'am, uh, uh, the question on my side is that at the primary level, at the primary stage, I saw that some of uh, most of the students are struggling to deal with the conceptual cl uh, clarity about the chemistry. Like, uh, and uh, this will lead uh, some kind of uh, like lacking the chem uh, to deal with the chemistry at the latter stage. Means they are not good enough to understand the part of the chemistry at uh, at the higher grades. So how can we cope up uh, at the early grades so that it cannot be it would not be difficult uh, for the students at the later stage? Is there any way like? Um, one thing I would like to say, Mayank is I believe that all students are capable of thinking about things, and all students. Are capable of you know uh, being a, their curiosity can be channeled into inquiry and you can help them think so I think everybody has the capacity the second is your question about how can they be prepared to you know enter chemistry or for uh, uh, you know learning chemistry at the higher grades I think by helping them to think about things like this, you know, like uh, ask them to observe, think about it. In, before this class with the candle, we had a very interesting session where uh, they were actually thinking about why something will burn and why something won't burn. And if you go back, uh, that's another link um, which you can look at is the ideas about burning involved a very curious uh, uh, material called phlogiston, which many years, it, it was there for 100 years, the idea of phlogiston was there. So I think um, we ourselves have to be very curious and very fascinated, right? I mean, quickly, if you ask any of us to say, what is a flame? You know, if you see every day, you know, matches jalate, candle jalate, kitchen mein gas jalate hai, flame but flame ke baare socha to fir wo hai kya teach like a thing what is it why is it blowing and you know it's a it's a very interesting question to ask so i think um children can definitely they will be more prepared to you know uh, appreciate chemistry if you do things like this that's uh, it means that uh, from your side, uh, you want to say that ki, uh, we need to uh, 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 ask the questions uh, again and again so that they take more interest in uh, finding the answer from their own side. But uh, due to the limitation of the classroom timing, uh, it, it is a time consuming process as you are asking the more and more inquiry, inquiry type questions. So I think that, that kind of thing is missing in the Indian education system right now. Yeah, I, I, I think um, my own uh, thing would be, and maybe the NEP is actually talking of, you know, uh, working on the curriculum so that there are not so many different things to be learned, but a few things can be learned more deeply. And I think uh, the habit of inquiry can be developed. 
so then afterwards you don't have to ask questions actually we we i feel we should not ask questions the question should come from them like this question about what is a flame actually came from the child and i the and like i said earlier children who we don't think are very bright are the ones who will ask these questions and uh, the bright ones uh, already know the answers so they are they are so not in it uh, really. yeah. so in this process our role is changed yeah so yeah. in this process our role is changed into the facility facilitation yeah. Yeah. but again the thing is that ki uh, we have to ask uh, when they uh, ask inquiry from their own side but again there is a limitation in the time hmm? because and there is a process in assessment then then there is a process uh, pro, uh, then there is a uh, problem in assessment ki how you assess the child so means some or how the child is struggling uh, to deal with all these things in the kind of system we have right so yeah i think yeah. yeah but it's a good to know and good to listen to you like thank you thank you ma'am for your precious time to me thanks ma'am i would also like to add to what mr mayank had just mentioned actually this question i even i had in my mind the approach this inquiry based learning approach is actually very effective in class learning and i have also applied in my classes but the problem that i face in the classes with the current assessment patterns that we follow in our uh, indian education system which is based mostly written assessments so we need to cover a lot of portions in lot of topics in one academic session and the assessments are go on along with it so we focus more on copy work and spend more time uh, uh you know preparing children to learn and to mug up those things which encourages route learning so i want to know your thoughts on how to how we can change that kind of learning and bring them to this inquiry based learning how can we inculcate as teachers this kind of learning in our classes because a uh, time constraint is there you know we have limited time then we have n number of activities holidays and uh, session breaks so it, i think i'm struggling with this so i have i wanted to ask what are your thoughts on this my my thoughts are a bit revolutionary i would say you have to you have to rebel you have to say i will teach it like this and uh, i will maybe teach some portions um only but as long as the child understands i think they are in a much better position and find out better ways of assessment i know it's easier said than done but what are we assessing i mean what is the what is the use of a child being able to rote learn and produce some answer there is no use it is no not useful for him it is not useful for me as a teacher it is not useful for anybody i mean I why are we doing this and unless each of us has uh, takes up responsibility and says we will not do this this kind of nonsense work we will i think we will keep on going round and round and round yes, yes ma'am totally yeah. because i feel we are giving them facts and information and then trying to assess that you know information which we have already given to them trying to measure how much of uh, un understanding of that concepts and information facts they have when actual learning i feel is not happening in the class yeah i mean i won't be so uh, <laughs> uh, negative also some learning does take place so the more and more authentic uh, ways we find of you know finding out what uh, children are understanding and we can do it not necessarily always through pen and paper tests like i said you know like this child who used the word evaporate but actually when you when probed he could give the right answer that it becomes the right answer means what i what is more uh, accepted that you know that the candle has wax has changed into something else and i said ah, okay he has understood that thing it is easy for me to then say that's not evaporation something else has happened and clarify the term problem but i feel you know we we can do the work at right now i mean practically speaking we may have to kind of do a bit of a hybrid you keep some topics which we through uh, inquiry and then children learn to inquire 
and uh, some topics we can be more traditional in our approach uh, and um, find also ways of assessing right so leave the board exam but there, there are in between assessments which we can do uh, ourselves as teachers right and we can prove that the children have understood yes. thank you Thank you, ma'am. Um, so, yes, Vani, you do you want to say something? Your hands are raised. Yeah, yeah. So, I have a quick question, although I've joined late in the session. So, uh, so basically, the, like, so I work in an organization where I'm actually working on math and curriculum. So, I was reading one paper that talks about see, how when we introduce any concept, it's, uh, it's more than like we try to relate that concept to the child's life. So, if you are introducing water, they'll say, he, uh, but we try to connect it with the with the daily life example. Uh, it's more of a on their perception model. But when we actually dwell into the uh, into the chemistry concept, then we talk about that concept model where we discuss the the atomic structure of a water. So uh, so I don't know for the for a style or for like how it can like, I don't know like and in that journey I somehow feel like. There should be some bridge between this, like like connecting some of the daily life things to getting into the atomic model and to the to the to the uh, to that thing. So how can we go about it? I don't know. That's a, I, I I'm not sure if my question is making sense. But this is something struggle I in working with the kids, like because when uh, when uh, because when we assess them or when we have a test or when we generally take like, the, the more you delve into this, things get into more of a, on a concept concept model and then then the students also pick up some misconception so yeah how should we go about this yeah um i mean uh, one is again getting back to the first part of uh, uh, you know bck which is what is our orientation towards science teaching so why are we teaching children about the um, atomic model or if you like the molecular structure of water right um one is that helps children to understand why water is water right what is the thing at the right stage and i think water is something which is so easy to connect i mean uh, i think somewhere around um, well ninth standard or so when they are already familiar with things like um, and I wouldn't actually introduce uh, anything about the molecular structure of water before that. I mean, it's it's really no point. Why would you do that? Um, so anyway, at that time when you are when they are able to grasp the idea of molecular mass and so on and so forth, uh, I would start by saying water is a most peculiar thing. I mean, anything which has a comparable molecular mass is a gas but at you know a normal temperature but water is a liquid so why can we examine what is so magical about water and uh, you know and then uh, start that line of inquiry about uh, about you can even you know actually we take water for granted but if you look at it it is a very peculiar thing i mean you and you have to point out the peculiarity and then get students to think. We don't we don't sort of think that it is weird that ice floats on water. It is terribly weird. Why should ice float on water? It's weird. I mean, if you melt wax or you melt ghee, the solid part is at the bottom, the liquid part is on top because we learnt in, uh, you know, when you heat something, it expands. The water is weird. And then you can, you know, get into why is water weird, what makes up water, etc, etc. So I think that's a way to connect instead of, you know, isolatedly teaching them that water is H2O, etc, etc. So that's, that's how I would have. Yeah. 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 This is helpful. Thank you. Welcome. Um, just a quick one. Asha has, a, uh, has put up on the chat that um the bck gets refined with every classroom interaction yes if the teacher is reflective bck is constantly being built you will use something that you understand then try something new and sometimes it's a new topic sometimes a new kid sometimes it's a new question from a kid uh, so bck keeps getting developed that's right Uh, 
Thank you very much, ma'am. Since we are running out of time, I request all the participants to send the queries or doubts regarding the topic via email. We'll make sure that your questions will be answered as early as possible. Now let us wind up the session with a word of thanks. Um, yeah. It is such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank our speaker for the sixth session of our lab discussion series, Professor Indra. Vijayam Sima, ma'am, we are very grateful to you for teaching us different nuances of science and its pedagogy. When you spoke about language barrier, you know, uses of jargon that we are very much aware, okay, this children, uh, this child will do that, but we only use jargon, we only use very difficult terms. That is also, this uh, things uh, opened a rise. And I would also like to express my gratitude to the all esteemed of the session for the, their presence. I must thank the organizing team volunteers for working hard for the past few days to make this session successful. And thank you everyone once again for making it a great success. Thank you everyone. Thank you. I enjoyed the interaction too. Yes. Thank you very much.